Uh, tonight, what I will tell you is not rumor. Tonight, I will tell you what I have seen and what I have heard myself. And I will tell you about Clonard, the attack which was made on Clonard. You don't suppose we'll forget it uh, easily. The night of Thursday, the 14th of August. We remember that night in the early hours of the following morning when the Falls Road area was devastated by gunfire and by petrol bombs. I was standing at a fourth story window in the monastery here in Clonard, looking out on the scene of desolation. And as I saw the leaping flames reddening the sky and the machine gun fire breaking the silence of the night, I found myself asking this question. Is it possible that only two or three days ago we were assured by Stormount spokesmen that the forces of law and order had everything completely under control. What brought them into the area? Themselves? What do you mean, and what all, brought all them in? that destruction, that crowd from the Shankill Road, that We'd every bell couldn't come out here at open fire and just let them people walk out and let touch them. These people here couldn't come out to defend themselves because the bee specials were down. standing by them. They led them down. The bee specials got machine guns. They led them down. Sure, the bee specials led them. And they come on the radio and television and say that there was a... Uh, they were we were shooting the machine time. gunned us. All those well, people. Well, did you shoot back? What, what, with pea shooters and bottles? Armoured cars paving the way for the hooligans to come in? The people of Diva Street will never forget their night of fear last night. Two people died in these flats as three armoured cars sprayed bullets during sorties up and down Diva Street throughout the night. The RTE camera crew were filming the sh who were filming the shooting were trapped for a period in automatic crossfire in a laneway off this street. The nine-year-old boy, Patrick Rooney, was shot dead in his bed. The other fatality here was a man believed to be on a soldier on compassionate leave. His body was found on the roof here. Tension mounts this afternoon in Diva Street again as barricades here are being erected. The people of the flat say there's going to be more trouble tonight. Later that morning, a voice on the telephone warned the community in Clonard that they had better clear out or they'd be burned out. We didn't clear out and we're still here. But anyway, the message came across and a priest in the monastery that you know only too well, not myself, brought this message to the local police station. He phoned the message to them and they promised protection, but no help came. At three o'clock on Friday afternoon, the trouble really started. When a large mob, I think no other word would describe them, a large mob advanced from the Cooper Street area. I do not say for a moment that they, they were residents of Cooper Street. I do say they came from that area, armed with stones and sticks and petrol bombs. At that time, I didn't see any other instrument, uh, but they advanced on the Catholic areas. Well, the crowds came in from those side streets of the Shankill Road and all around about now. They came up in hundreds and they were led by a, a character. He was stripped to the waist. He had nothing on him his trousers. He was stripped to the waist and he was shouting, burn them out and get the young ones, get the young ones, get the young ones. Well, when I looked down and seen the hundreds of them there was, and all it was in our street, there was nothing in our street, only women and children and old age pensioners. But when I seen this character and all the crowds and they were throwing stones and petrol bombs and like everything we could do, I just got the children, grabbed them and I run with them. Like I'm been quite honest to run with them because you couldn't have done, done nothing else, you know, but the crowds there was. 
at this particular time of day, three o'clock approximately, as you would expect, the men of the area were away at work. So the defense of the place was left to a handful of teenagers and they did a great job. We were proud of them. They hurled every missile they could lay their hands on into the faces of the advancing assailants. They did a good job. The opposition Protestant people started through the stones and petrol bombs right what up. What time was this? About half past two in the afternoon. And it kept on going all afternoon up to about seven o'clock. We hadn't a policeman to protect us. And we were left holding the baby all the time for to fight ourselves. No defence of any kind except stones and what we had not what we could find in the streets. Next thing that happened was the people in the opposition said they are supplied with the guns from the B specials. Were they using guns? They were using guns. We hadn't a gun at all. And uh, we managed to get four guns unauthorised from our people. And if I hadn't had those guns, the whole place would have been taken over by did them. You, did you use these guns? They did use those guns, yes. But it was more or less to frighten them off. But what happened then? Did they actually come into the area? They came into the area lots of times, but were able to chase them off again, and with the shots of the guns, it made them fly off again. And they're the bravest people and the friendliest people that ever lived round about here. I and I blame the IRA. There's no IRA that I know of about, but I wish I had been an IRA woman. I would have been here on the spot and had a machine gun. Were, were all these houses occupied yesterday? They were all occupied, yes, yesterday, all by Roman Catholics. And um, where are these people now? All those people are away up living in different places, such as different areas, such as Turf Lodge, um, different other places like um, St. Thomas's School, some of them up there. An urgent phone message went out from Clarnard Monastery to the local police station asking for protection for the threatened area. The call was received politely, but no help came. After making a vain attempt to stop the fighting down there at the junction of Cooper Street, I heard a number of women and girls panicking. They were shrieking and crying all over the place. So I directed them to the monastery. I went with them, brought them in through the kitchen into the monastery where a large number of people had already gathered. Indeed, the people were all over the place. They were up the stairs, they were in rooms where I certainly never saw a female in my life. They were every place. It was open house. It was a time of emergency. Oh gosh, we said they had guns and ammunition, and we hadn't anything at all. Where were you at this time? Well, we had a fly into the corner to the church, the monastery, and we had to crawl along on our tummies, you know, uh, to save ourselves from getting shot you know, through one of the windows. Were there and any there people who were the there was sniping, you know, from everybody had sort of cleared out from this part, you know, and there was sniping from the roofs and, you know, they're getting over that way. Well, we hadn't anything to protect ourselves at all. It was at this stage that I heard the first shots ringing out. And moments later, looking through a window in the monastery, I saw a prostrate figure on the pavement below. The exact spot, the exact spot is at the lamp post which is directly opposite the old credit union offices in Waterville Street. The body was lying there. I dashed down the stairs at once onto the street. A man had arrived there before me, one I think, I wouldn't be sure of that, I looked into the face of the boy whom I didn't recognize at the time, it was Gerard McCauley, and Gerard was still conscious. He opened his eyes and I did think that he showed signs of recognition as he looked at me. I gave him absolution, I anointed him, I helped to put him on a lorry 
Just at that stage, an ambulance arrived and we got him onto the ambulance and I was told afterwards that he died on the way to hospital. Have you heard all the tales of the Kashmir? Where most of the fighting was done It was there young Geraldo Macaulay Was shot by an orange sniper's gun Somebody had been here and inquiring was there any further news about Gerald and uh, I said no and I was leaving the corner just as that father made him out of St Paul's Chapel came forward Father who? Made him and he asked me was I waiting for my son and I said yes I was and um, he says well your son won't be coming home he says because he's gone to heaven and he just turned in his heels and went away at that all I'd been told was, and what I've read in the paper was, that he was just after bringing women and children in to say to the monastery. And it seems he had just left them in when Father Regan left him for to go and make some arrangements for to have tea and that made for the people that were in the chapel. And uh, it seems Gerald, as soon as he left them, had just walked out. Now, I know there was no crowds or anything else. He must have been about the only one in that street at that particular time, whenever the sniper got him. And the thing that mostly kills me about that is that, that he wasn't in a mob. He was just innocently enough coming out, as I say, to that chapel. And that man could make such a brutal and animal attack on him to take his life. A father from the monastery, accompanied by a layman from the locality, went to visit the local police station, appealing for help. There were a number of police officers sitting around. They said their orders were to remain in barracks. News of the attack spread like wildfire, the attack on the Clonard area. And men came speeding from their work to protect their homes and protect their families and protect their church. And goodness knows they had very, very little with which to protect themselves. Comparatively speaking, you could say the men in this area were defenseless, comparatively speaking. Within the space of one hour, I anointed five people out there on the roadway. Well, I got shot in the back, and I was shot in the chest, and I was shot with a rifle in the stomach. And, that was, and I got my hand broken. They broke my hand with the butt of a rifle. They broke my hand, broke my thumb, and they beat me on top of the head with a, with a rifle, and they blackened my two eyes. They hit me there but with a rifle, too. Fearing a real massacre, I got on the phone and I had to go across the roadway to do it because our own phone was out of order. I got on the phone with the GCO headquarters of the British forces in Lisbon. The GCO was not available, but the officer who took the call said he would do his best to help. And at about seven o'clock in the evening, the first group of soldiers arrived and they marched through Clonard Street, Clonard Gardens, and took up their position down in the Falls Road. Now you will understand that soldiers in the Falls Road are pretty useless as far as protecting the Clonard area is concerned when you are being attacked from the rear, as we were, from the Cooper Street area. So I sped down to the Falls Road. I met the officer in charge of the soldiers. 
I tried to explain the position to him. He said he had his orders, and being a military man, of course, he had to take them, I suppose, but I must admit that at a time like this, when you see a boy being murdered, when you see people, defenseless people being shot down and the houses burned over their heads, well, little bits of rules and regulations and orders do not appear very important. They certainly did not appear very important to me that evening. As I talked, an officer of higher rank came along and he listened sympathetically and he said that he would try to help. At nine o'clock, that would be about two hours later, another group of soldiers arrived and they took up their position outside the church to protect the area. They got into military formation and they charged down along these streets, charging the attackers. And the man in command he shouted out an order, come out, he said to the assailants, come out, he said, with your hands up and we'll not shoot. But the command was answered by a litany of obscenities, punctuated with uncomplimentary references to the Pope and the Fenians and uh, the British Tommies. Instead of coming out with their hands up, they shortly came out with guns blazing and petrol bombs being fired all over the place. More houses were set on fire and at their approach the soldiers turned and ran away. And it was a Welsh regiment that moved in on about 12 o'clock, about 11 o'clock I'd say, uh, they made another attack from the prison area and the troops ran away and left it. They were frightened and one of the men that apparently, as I'm led to believe, was injured and they even went on the way and left them. Well, listen, how did they actually burn these houses along here? By throwing petrol bombs over the roof from the prison area. They didn't actually come into the street? They did. Some of them came up as far as this here. And this house here, here behind you is still yeah. burning? Yes, yes that's right. Still, well, did they, they throw... still burning this morning, as a matter of fact. Right. In fact, mm -hmm. even this morning, at, at about, around about 8 or 9 o'clock, the military were here and um, what happened next was there's a couple of snipers and the military had to get off and we had to desert the streets and the military had to go in the back to see if they could get the snipers here. This is only at 10 o'clock this morning, I guess. But they didn't catch them, the snipers. Now, I haven't heard, in spite of all this gunplay coming from that area, I certainly have not heard that on the following morning police tenders pulled up outside the houses of well-known leaders of uh, the extreme Protestants, pulling men out of their beds and taking them into custody on the suspicion of their being in possession illegally of arms. I haven't heard that. And if you heard it, I'd be very interested if you'd come along and tell me. Because as far as I know, during 50 years of British rule in six counties of Ireland, that has never happened. Again, we are tempted to ask ourselves, is, was it perhaps people who were the legal possessors of firearms who did the shooting on this occasion? But that supposition is too dreadful to pursue it. After retreating, the military soon reformed their ranks. And they came down along these streets again. And they took up their position, some on the Cash Kashmir Road and some on Waterville Street. But undaunted by the military presence, the attackers came along again with their petrol bombs and systematically, I watched it from an upstairs window, systematically they went from door to door 
in Bombay Street, kicking in some doors, breaking some windows, and throwing petrol bombs into the houses. They stood outside the school and in full view of the military. They broke the windows and threw bombs, fire bombs, into the premises, into the schoolroom. Now, men, do not for one moment think that I blame the military. I do not for one moment blame them. They had orders, and their orders on this particular night was, don't fire. So they told me afterwards, because I was amazed at the performance, and I asked them about it, and they told me their orders were not to fire. I do not blame these men who must act on their orders, but I certainly do blame the people who gave the information which resulted in the military getting that type of order. The people who supplied that information are the people who are responsible for most of the destruction done in Bombay Street and in the Connard area. Three times that school, beside our monastery, was set on fire. And three times our local boys went into that school, into the blazing school, and with bullets whistling all over the place, I was with them once in the school, and I didn't feel a bit brave. When you hear these bullets whistling all over the place, these lads went in there, and three times they fought the fire with extinguishers which they got from the monastery. Again and again, these attackers came during the night and during the early hours of the morning, and outside the monastery and outside the school, they chanted, encouraging each other, let's get the so-and-so school, let's get the so-and-so monastery. That was the cry during the night. Well, they failed. They failed in their evil design that night. But their failure, my dearest men, was not due to any protection given by the forces of law and order. And let that be recorded. Let it also be recorded that they failed because of the bravery of the local lads who, totally unprepared and ill-equipped, and comparatively speaking defenseless, fought against terrible odds and saved this area from complete destruction. The vast majority of Protestants are thoroughly ashamed of what has happened. You have, of course, the lunatic fringe amongst them. You have the extremists and you have their leaders. And you have the leaders of the so-called leaders of this little statelet which have done nothing at all to deal with those people. That is an abuse which we hope will be remedied. What we are aiming at now, my dearest men, is justice. No more and certainly no less. Certainly no less, my dear me. That's one lesson we must learn from what has happened. We demand justice. We're not just begging it. We demand it. It's our right. And we'll keep on demanding it until we get it. We don't ask for any more. Just a fair deal. No discrimination in the matter of housing or jobs or voting power or anything else. Just a fair deal. Mr. McMacken, is this your home here? This is my home here. What, what, what's happened to it? Well, you see, as you see, it's burned on the roofs of it and everything's burned upstairs and racked downstairs and burned as well and scorched everything. You know, you know like it, you couldn't live. I mean, you see, there's no use of talking about you couldn't live when there's no roof or anything, don't you know? That's it. Do you feel bitter about this? No, I'm not bitter about it. 
because bitterness would do no good. So it wouldn't. I consider that uh, the mob that done this are an unthinking mob, and they're a mob that have been uh, misled. Don't you know? I know rightly that it's Paisley, and he's proud, and I don't care who's in it, whether they're my friends or not. Anybody connected with Paisley has a hand in this here, and anything else has happened in Belfast. Do you believe that in places like Bombay Street and areas where there has been burning and where people have been shot, it is right to be meek and mild, as some suggest, or as the majority seem to suggest, to arm and be prepared? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know that very many people suggest that they are be armed, but uh, naturally, if a man's home is attacked, he surely uh, will have a duty to try to defend it to the best of his ability. What do you think of these new houses they've built round the corner in the street where you were shot? Bombay Street. They're nice houses. They're right on the peace line, aren't they? They are, yes. How long are they going to be there? Is that what you're going to ask me, how long will they be there? They'll be there forever. They'll never burn us out again. <laughs>